Hello, I'm Jim Sloan. We're going to do a Bible study. Uh, we've been doing a Bible study on the Lord's Prayer for a long while at meeting at 6.33 on Wednesday nights at Aldersgate. Also doing that same kind of study at uh, Sesser United Methodist Church at 1 o'clock on Tuesday afternoons. But I'm going to change my pace a little bit. Did last week as we come into Holy Week. And now that uh, we have passed Easter and we are still in that season where we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I want to do a lesson today that is about the resurrection. We'll get back to the Lord's Prayer in a week or two and finish that off. But uh, tonight I'd like to talk to you a little bit about something that we find in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. It's a story you're probably very familiar with, but we'll talk about it and do a little bit of a study on it. Uh, we are very glad that you're watching this, that you're able to tune in. I know some people have had a little difficulty finding the site and then being able to keep it up and do all of the kinds of things. We've got all kinds of uh, issues we've got to work through. I've got to learn how to uh, look a little bit better on, on camera and uh, work, work a little bit more closely so that I can have conversation with you. So uh, take your Bibles, and we're going to study through this. Let's pray together before we get into chapter 20 in the Gospel of John. I want you to get there. Chapter 20, the Gospel of John. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can gather here. And uh, Lord, although we're gathering through the advantage of modern technology, God, we thank you for the ability to do that, the ability to share together. And Lord, I pray that you give me an anointing and a clarity to be able to teach this truth that is here, to unlock any of the secrets of Scripture, which you don't want to be secret. You want it to get out. The Lord, to enable us to understand what your Word says, and more than just understand it, to make an application of it in our lives. Lord, we pray that this would be not only informative, but more than ever transformative. We pray that for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and lives today, pours out His Spirit, we pray. Amen. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, John tells us about Jesus' first appearance to His disciples after He is resurrected. What He tells us in verses 19 and 20 is that on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday on our calendar, Jesus was resurrected that morning, and that evening, he made his first appearance to the disciples as a group. When it talks about the 12 in Scripture, that's not necessarily counting the number 12, because actually, at that point, there were 10 there, but it's talking about that body of believers, the 12 disciples, that we usually think of as following Jesus from Galilee on down to Jerusalem, and then taking up the apostolic, being the apostles that proclaimed that word. Judas, by this time, had hanged himself. And as they gathered that night in a, a room in Jerusalem, behind locked doors, because they were afraid. If Jesus had been executed, they believed that Jewish leadership or Roman leadership may be now hunting for them, and so they locked the doors and were gathering together, kind of huddled in fear, when suddenly Jesus appeared in the midst of them. He was there through the locked doors. They had heard rumors. The women had come back and said he's raised from the dead. John and Peter had seen that the tomb was empty and his grave clothes were laying there. And a couple of the disciples that had been headed to Emmaus, whether it was part of the 12 disciples or others, we think it probably was others, they had reported that they had seen the Lord. But now they're in this upper room, Sunday evening service, in uh, the, a fearful place, and Jesus appears in their midst. And he says, peace be to you. Well, they are still trembling in fear. And Jesus shows them his hands and his side, and he is telling them, it's me. It is I myself, is what one of the translations say. It is I myself, and he revealed himself to them by the wounds in his hands and the wound in his side. Now, what it tells us there is 
that they rejoiced. They were glad to see Jesus. He spoke to them, told them to receive the Spirit. He said, as I have, uh, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And he was telling them to go proclaim this gospel. That's what they're going to be doing on later. But it tells us as they gathered there, Thomas, one of the disciples that was a very faithful disciple, and had been quite, not, not like Peter and James and John, as far as notoriety, but right there with Philip and Andrew, certainly, and being a, a disciple that had been recognized and speaks up from time to time, Thomas was not there. Thomas was not there. So we pick up at verse 24, chapter 20, and we're going to talk about a little bit of what happens when Thomas, who was missed that service, what he says says, Now Thomas called the twin. Some of your translations there say Didymus. Didymus is a word for twin, and it's from which we get the word ditto. Ditto means a second one like the previous. Well, Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in, I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas says, I've got to see this for myself. They told him, and Thomas says, I'm not going to believe this without examining the body. Thomas is saying, I've got to see and feel. I need to touch this body of Jesus. Thomas is saying, I, I don't want to talk, we're not talking here about just a spiritual resurrection. And some people today try to say, well, Jesus wasn't really resurrected bodily, it was a spiritual resurrection. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe that. And Thomas says, I don't want to see any kind of uh, apparition. He said, I want, I'm not going to believe this. I'm not going to put my faith in the resurrection of Jesus until I can touch him, examine that body, see that it is a real body, examine this miracle, examine this resurrection. That's verses 25. That's what he says he's going to do. A little bit further on with that, what he's saying is, I have to have personal knowledge. The disciples were telling him that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe this till I know it myself, my personal experience of it. A lot of times we do that. We say, uh, you know, uh, as far as believing, I, I'm not going to believe what somebody else tells me. I've got to experience this for myself. That can be good. Quite often it's bad. Sometimes it's really bad because we say, well, I'm not going to believe what somebody tells me about driving too fast or doing certain things to my body. There's a lot of ways that we can take that and say that uh, that's very dangerous. But when it comes to the things of God, we say, I want to know for myself. While there's, there's a certain piece of nobility in that, and there's a certain piece of authenticity in it, and it also so can be something that we're just saying, I'm not going to believe it unless I experience it. I'm not going to believe it's true. We've got to be careful that we don't make ourselves the criterion for what is true and not true. We get right back to what happened in Eden, saying uh, we will become like gods. We will eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'll decide what's true and not true. No, God does that, and we need to watch that we don't become doubters because we have to have it by personal experience. At the same time, I'm one of those, and old-time Methodists were that way, but it's just good evangelical Christianity, just good Christianity. We need to have personal experience with God. We need to have the personal experience of God's Spirit in our life and Jesus Christ revealed to us. But Thomas is here now talking, I, I'm not going to believe in that resurrection until I can do it. You know what Thomas is doing? You stop and think about this. Thomas is saying, I am not going to believe this until I can do an autopsy. This is Jesus' autopsy. He says, I've got to do an autopsy. What uh, he's saying is, I want to do this examination. Now, I got to thinking about this and saying, if this is an autopsy of Jesus, what's involved in that? And uh, I looked in my different dictionaries and got some ideas, but I had a pretty good idea of what an autopsy was. If you're going to examine the body, 
Uh, most of us think of an autopsy. We've seen enough TV and need enough of those type of uh, crime mov movies or television shows or read the books or heard about it that we examine, not just to find out who did a crime, but more behind that is to examine the body to see the cause of death. Now we're going to take just a little bit of a sidetrack here, but it's important. And that is important as we look at what is going on in this story. First of all, I want you to remember when we say, what is the cause of his death? Jesus died because he was wounded on the cross. The nails in his hand, the nails in his feet, and then particularly the spear driven up into his side that would have gone into the heart, right up into that area of his body on that left side. You look at that and say, what caused Jesus' death? His beating, his suffering, the nails, he's been on the cross. That caused his death. But as you look through Scripture, it goes back even beyond that. Now, in, in Jesus identifying himself first to the disciples that first night, was it? he shows them his hand and his side is what John says. Over in Luke, the 24th chapter, Luke tells the same incident. He tells different things that happened that night. But he says essentially the same thing. Only, only difference that Luke makes in his identifying, how Jesus identified himself, he shows him his hands, the nail prints, and his feet. So it's the wounds of Jesus that Jesus is showing that identifies who he is. People, that's really important. That's, that's back there in verse 20. And then when Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it until what? I see the wounds, but my finger... In those nail scars, put my hand up in his side. Am I going to believe it? Later on, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but when Jesus does appear to Thomas, he says, here, put, put your hand, put your finger in my, my nail printed hands. Put your hand into my side. And uh, the, the emphasis there is that Jesus is carrying those wounds. Now, this body of Jesus had been beaten beyond recognition, actually. That's what the Bible tells us, beyond recognition. Back in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, it tells us that as a prophetic word. Now, everything seems to be healed on him, but the nail prints, the ribbon side, and the feet still bear those scars. Now, why? What's going on here? That just shows the, the purpose, the cause of Jesus' death is in those scars. And in those scars, it isn't just the cause of Jesus' death is that he was beaten and stabbed and nailed to a cross. What it is saying is, Jesus bore our sins. Go back to Isaiah chapter 53. And I'll read this scripture for you. I wrote it down on a piece of paper here. But listen to when we talk about what is the cause of, his, of Jesus' death. Why did he die? Why, why this autopsy? And he says, uh, He was wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah 53, 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Verse 8 in that says, For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Go back to that very first line in verse 5 of chapter 53 of Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. Why Jesus died, the cause of his death was our sins. He came to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus bears that throughout eternity. His scars will carry throughout eternity. Your name is written on his hands. What he's saying is the cause of his death... He wasn't a victim of the Roman powers or the treachery of the religious powers of that day. Jesus laid down his life and what caused his death, of why he came to this earth, he came as the Lamb of God. A Lamb came to be slain. A Lamb of God to bear our sins. Listen, people. Our sins, your sins, my sins is the cause of his death. And he makes that point very much. So we say, well, we're going to do an autopsy of Jesus. Why did he die? What caused this death? I caused the death. My sins. Your sins. We caused his death. But as I got to looking at, 
and what an autopsy is, and really trying to get a hold of it in the dictionary, I was a little, uh, a little surprised by what I found. Because when I got to reading the definitions, an autopsy, and you break that down with its etymology, an autopsy is a eyewitness account. It, it is a, an eyewitness observation. And so I got a, a, a dictionary. Uh, let me get the one here that, that is, uh, this is, this is one that I use a lot, and it, it's still very effective. It was put out a few years ago, but it's a 1993 Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary, excellent dictionary, and it says, an examination of a body after death to determine the cause of death. But here's it also, a critical examination, evaluation, or an assessment. I got to thinking about that, look at the etymology, and we'll get to that in a moment, and I went back and got an old dictionary, uh, Cheryl's Grandmother's Dictionary. It was uh, from 1943, and I thought, what does it say there? And their definition was a little simpler. It said, a, uh, again, it's a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, the 5th edition. I just quoted to you from the 10th edition. But it says, a personal observation, an ocular view, and then it says, inspection and partial dissection of a dead body. A personal observation. Got to thinking, what is he saying? He's saying, I want to know why Jesus died. But he's saying, I want to examine it for myself. Now the word autopsy, just hang on with me because we need to know what words mean. I've always said, if we don't know what the words mean, it's awfully hard to understand the word that God has given to us. Autopsy is a uh, word that comes to us from a, two Greek words. The first one, the auto, ought, is talking about the person, myself. The latter part, opt, and the opsi part of it, is a word for to see, to view. So when we talk about optics, we go to an optometrist, we're using that word. We're using that word that means to see, to observe, to be able to, what we use our eye. And the etymology of that word says it is an eyewitness observation. And so it's not... It, it wasn't used to talk about examining a dead body until the 17th century. But in the 17th century, near the latter part of the 17th century, it, we find it first used that way, and it's kind of evolved into when we talk about autopsy, that's what we think about. But the word itself really means to see for one's self. And that's what Thomas is saying. He said, I'm not only going to examine that body and see that it's a real body. I got to see this for myself. The disciples were telling him. The women had told him earlier and they thought it was foolishness. These disciples that had been on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and whoever was with him, they had told it. But now the twelve were telling him. And Thomas says, I've got to see it for myself. My own observation. Again, as I say, there's value in that. But we have to be careful and then listen to it. Well, how does Jesus respond to all of that? It says that eight days later. Now, when we say eight days later, that is uh, a week later because the way they would count the days, and you get this even with the death and resurrection, he would arise on the third day. Some people say, well, no, that was the second day. He must have been killed on Thursday. No, they counted that way. Friday is day one. Saturday is day two. And Sunday is day three, although he died on Friday afternoon and he's raised Sunday morning. Now, now we're saying eight, the eighth day, that eighth day later, that's the day, the first day of the week, a week away. And so the next Sunday evening, they're gathered together again, the disciples. This time, Thomas is with them. Same situation. They're in a locked room. Sometimes that doesn't come through in the English translation, but they've, the, the, the text there really says they were locked in. They were still fearful, even though they knew Jesus was resurrected. Now Thomas is with them this time, and Jesus appears again. And Jesus, when he appears, he speaks to Thomas. So we get here in this uh, 20th chapter, 
of uh, John. Let me get my right text here. I've got back over in here Luke, and we're going to get into John. John uh, tells us that, and after eight days, this is verse 26, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, and the doors being shut, that being shut means locked, and stood in the midst of them and said, what does Jesus say? Peace to you. Peace to you. And then, verse 27, he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hands here and put it into my side. Actually, when he says, reach your fingers here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side, do not be unbelieving, but believing. He says, Thomas, do the autopsy. Touch me. Put your fingers in there. Touch. This is real, as he says in the book of Luke, this is real flesh and bone. It's the real stuff. Flesh. I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. I'm not just something in your imagination. I'm real. You can touch me. Feel me. He says, Thomas, touch me. What's interesting here is Thomas does not probe. Thomas does, there's, there's no word here that says, Thomas went and stuck his finger in Jesus' nail prints. And there's no word here that says he put his hand up into his side. But he saw Jesus. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. One of the greatest confessions in all of the Bible. In fact, no one had made this confession up to that point. He is clearly speaking two great statements of deity about Jesus Christ, my Lord, but also my God. And uh, a Jewish man, w with the law that they had and, and how they were so strongly monotheistic, one God and one God only, they're not going to say, my Lord and my God, to another human being. And Thomas sees Jesus and he says, my Lord and my God. He recognizes that Jesus Christ the Son of God is God in the flesh. And He's now God in the flesh resurrected. God in the flesh who went to the cross and died for our sins, who is the atonement that puts us in a right relationship with God. And He speaks that. And Jesus then responds to Thomas. And Jesus' response is really a, a, a very powerful thing because He said, uh, be believing. Put your faith in me. By the way, let's get this clear. The word believe is the English translation when we use that Greek word pistuo in a verb form. The word faith is the word we use in English when we use that same Greek word in a noun form. And so he's saying, Thomas, believe. We could say also, Kind of change it a little bit, Thomas. Have faith. Have faith. It means a commitment. It isn't just, I got an intellectual acceptance that this is a true fact. It's more than that. It's to say, yeah, I believe this is the truth, but it's a truth that I commit myself to. I'm willing to make a commitment to it. I'm going to, I bank on this. I put my, I entrust myself to it. And then he says to Thomas, after Thomas says, my Lord and my God, that great confession, verse 28. Jesus in verse 29 said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. A beatitude, actually. Jesus said, here's a blessing. To those who have not seen me and believed, they're a blessing. And what, what Jesus does there and what John reports to us is very important for us. Because he's saying, to believe in Jesus Christ, even though we have not seen him, is a blessing as much as if we are seen. I want to be careful here because sometimes there's people say, well, Thomas, uh, you're blessed to see me and believe, but those who haven't seen me and believe, they're, they're even more blessed. There's no comparison here. No, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't go there. He doesn't say we're more blessed than Thomas was or Thomas is more blessed than we are. But every once in a while I come across somebody that said, well, I could really believe this. Had I been back there and actually saw Jesus and heard him teach and saw the miracles that he did and saw him in the resurrection, I could really believe then. That's sort of where Thomas was. I could really believe it if I could see it for myself. 
But Jesus says, no, that isn't a greater blessing. That isn't anything greater than to those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus is getting here to say, this is my faith. Not just a faith that says, I, I haven't seen, but it's a faith that commits itself. It's a faith that believes the truth. It's a faith that believes something. And so Jesus is commending Thomas here, but he's also giving us a great blessing and saying to all of us, we can be in on that. Peter writes in uh, his first chapter of his first epistle, and he talks about this Jesus whom uh, we have not seen yet we love. He is the one that has brought us salvation. We're looking for him. We long for him. And we, even though we have not seen him, yet we believe him. We have faith in him. We entrust ourselves into him, and it is our salvation. And so Jesus is making this statement here. Through this uh, 20th chapter, he's pointed out some people that believe that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, John, the beloved disciple, had gone to the tomb, saw that with Peter, and they saw the empty grave clothes, the empty tomb, the grave clothes that were there. And seeing that, it says John believed. He hadn't seen Jesus, but he saw the empty. He believed because of the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene was in the garden weeping. She actually saw Jesus, but she thought he was a gardener. But she believed when Jesus called her by name and said Mary and believed. The disciples in that upper room they believed when Jesus shows them the wounds. And now Thomas believes when he shows the wounds. And they're all blessed in that. But Jesus is telling us that me and you, down here, 21 centuries later, we too can be blessed. And blessed just as fully as Thomas was, who was there and wanted to do that personal knowledge, that personal knowledge of Thomas is something that we too can have. But we don't have to touch his body or even see his body to do that. Now, the issue for us is we say, okay, how are we at now in the 21st century, how are we to believe this? How, how is it that we can believe that Jesus is really resurrected from the dead, believe for our salvation? Well, John deals with that here. And uh, I want to make sure I get my notes straight here. So how is it we come to believe? John speaks of that and he just keeps if we just keep going beyond verse 29 he says in verse 20 or 30 now he's just told this story about thomas and his desire for an autopsy and now believing because he's seen and here's what jesus said and and truly jesus did many other signs and in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written that you that's us, the readers, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus is, or John rather, is saying, you, you, I'm writing this to pass this story on to you, to pass this truth on to you, so that you can believe this. This fourth gospel of John, and the whole of the New Testament does this as well as the Old, but, but John particularly is saying, I want you to understand he is, he, he is enticing us and persuading us to, as readers to venture our judgment upon history. He said, I want you to look at what history says. He's urging us to believe the message that he's written and the apostles gave down to us. This is really vital for us as to how we come to faith. I, I got to thinking about this a while back. I got to thinking about a lot of things I know. In fact, most things I know, uh, I didn't learn by personal experience as much as I learned by somebody else telling me. Uh, when it comes to history particularly, I never met Abraham Lincoln. I believe Abraham Lincoln lived because people who met him, knew him, knew about him, have told us about him, and I have heard that. I didn't know George Washington. I didn't know... I, I was born after World War II. My dad fought in World War II, and he told me a few things about it. I read it in history books. My teachers told me about it. So I have no personal experience with World War II at all, but I heard about it, and I believe it. Things in science. I mean, I've done some little 
experiments in the labs in high school or college and there may be some things that most everything I know, I, I know because they told me this rock man did, they told me what this star was. Somebody directed me and showed me. Most all things that I know and most all things you know, you didn't get by personal observation. You got it by somebody else giving you that message. And this is very vital in Christianity too. We need to come to a personal experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. But where do we start with that? We've got to start by believing what has been told. Start by believing the word of the apostles. The apostles are those who were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ, what he taught, what he did, his crucifixion, why he died, that he was resurrected and Paul, when he talks about the gospel in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he said, you know, Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried. He arose. He was raised on the third day according to the Scripture. And he appeared unto Cephas and the twelve. And he goes on. And to 500 brethren and to, the, uh, to, to others and to James. He talks about these that he has appeared to. And he says, last of all, to me, as one born out of due time, I, I experienced him and met him. But it's based on what these apostles had given. And Jesus even had prayed this. Back in the 17th chapter of uh, the book of uh, John, Jesus prayed this. He said, I don't pray for these alone. That was his apostles. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, folks, We've got to face this up. How, how do you believe them? I have, I have had people that say, well, I'd believe in Jesus if it was proven to me. What do you have to do to prove it to you? The history? The word of other people? The authentic lives of the apostles? This is what we're told to believe. In fact, our very salvation depends upon us believing what the word of God says, what the Holy Spirit will reveal to us, and that will bring us then to that personal experience. But we need to come to that. Romans chapter 10. Paul makes a real clear statement there about how we get saved, how we get in the right relationship with God. And here's what he says. If you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, uh, get it right, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart from the depth of who you are, you make this commitment that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scriptures say, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. So he said it doesn't make any difference whether you're Jewish or whether you're non-Jewish. Salvation is the same for all of us. There's no distinction, rich, poor, man, woman, black, white, whatever. No distinction. We're all saved the same way. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, listen to this, verse 14. He says, Now how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How can you call on a God you don't believe in? You don't have faith in him. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? I haven't even heard of him. I can't believe in him. And how shall they hear without a preacher? What he's saying there is very revealing. He's saying that we are to believe what has been proclaimed through the scriptures, what the apostles gave to us. Over in the book of Ephesians, he says the whole church is built on the witness of the apostles, the prophets and the apostles, Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles. The apostles, we... It's the basic doctrine. In, in the book of Acts, when it talks about what they did, what the early church was like, what, the, what a church is supposed to be, they continued steadfast in the apostles' teaching. That's number one. That's the first thing that's mentioned. They believed what Peter had preached and the apostles preached. They believed what they taught and they committed themselves to it. The marvelous thing that is being said here to Peter when Jesus says... Uh, you have seen and you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. This isn't one against the other. It's actually a progression. He's saying, Thomas, you and the apostles, you've seen me resurrected. You're to be my witnesses. You write it down. You go preach it. You go tell it. 
And the early apostles, the ones that had been with him, they did that very thing. And they have preached it and taught it. And that history and literature has been given to us. And we're called to believe what they have conveyed to us. And as we believe what they have conveyed to us, we take that to heart and we really believe it. We, we then, I, I, we're, we're like Paul and like other Christians throughout history, we have our personal encounter then with Jesus Christ who is alive and we come to know him as alive. I'm sorry really hard to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ when I don't believe what I've been told, when I don't accept the truth that has been handed down by these faithful people of God and how God wanted to do it. People preaching and proclaiming the word, reading the scriptures, sharing that is absolutely vital. We need to be telling the world, we need to believe ourselves what the apostles told us and what Jesus prayed that we would believe that message. Vital doctrine. We need to hold to it. Pray that you would believe the word, you would receive him for yourself, and uh, what you can't see with your eyes, you would experience with your heart. Now, I appreciate you watching, Dave. We'll be doing this as long as we have this uh, stay-in-place order here in the state of Illinois. It looks like we'll be doing it for a while. There are several other things that are available on Aldersgate's website. You check them out. The Sunday services are on the radio, and I've been listening on 95.5, uh, 8.30 on Sunday mornings, but you can check for other, other uh, broadcasts. Many good things are being broadcasted around. I appreciate it. Do remember that there are still expenses going on with the church staff, and uh, even though we can't use the building, we still have expenses for electricity and others. So just keep that in mind in your giving. But above all things, keep, keep faithful to Jesus Christ. He is alive. He reigns today. And we can believe that word is, that has been given to us. You can believe it as well as you can believe. Anything has come down through history. The evidence and the witness of the resurrection is just as powerful. And in fact, much more evidence than most all the other historical evidence of that time. God bless you. Thank you for watching this.